discussion and questions. Remember that we will be together again next Wednesday at the same time to hear from survivors and co-survivors on their personal experience. You will receive a reminder using the email address you provided for that session as well. Before we get started, let me introduce Dr. Dyson. Dr. Don Dyson is a professor of medicine at Brown University, director of women's cancers at Lifespan Cancer Institute, and director of medical oncology at Rhode Island Hospital. He is a medical oncologist specializing in women's cancers and the founder and director of the Oncology Sexual Health Responder Clinic at Rhode Island Hospital that's devoted to men and women experiencing sexual dysfunction after cancer. He does research in many areas, including novel treatments, survivorship after cancer, and social media. He writes a column for ASCO Connection and the Oncologist Medical Journal, where he focuses on the human experience of doctoring in order to provide a glimpse of the physician as a person. He is active on several social media platforms, including Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and is a chair of digital engagement of the SWOG Cancer Research Network, a member of the National Clinical Trials Network funded by the National Institute of Health. You can find him online at, at Dr. Don Dyson, and that's D-R-D-O-N. S-D-I-Z-O-N. Just a few housekeeping items for today. You may use the chat to say hello and where you're from, as well as insights or your own experience. Please ask questions and also share your experiences in the Q&A box. All right, let's get started. So I have some questions ready, uh, queued up here to ask. So Dr. Dyson, what is the difference between sex and intimacy? That's always a really important place to start. And just, just so you know, it's D's on, kind of like the mustard. <laughs> Thank you. You said it correctly when we first met. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, it's totally fine. Well, you know, I think, uh, What's, what's important to know is that sexuality and intimacy are related, but they're not the same in terms of a concept. You know, if you think of sexuality, it's multi don't, there, there are multiple domains to that. One of those domains is intimacy. Now, it's an important concept because women and men think of it so very differently. And, and the, in the context of same-sex relationships, there should be more cohesion, but even there, Things can change after cancer for the one who underwent the experience. But sexuality is a very broad term and it encompasses all of what we think of when it comes to um, sexual health. So we're talking about arousal, we're talking about body image, we're talking about intimacy, satisfaction, even orgasm. So it's a combination of the biological, the psychological and the social domains that govern sexuality. Intimacy is really just a portion of that. Awesome. Thank you for that clarity. So how can sex be physically different for someone after a breast cancer diagnosis? Well, you know, we'd like to think that, you know, whether it's a, a same-sex couple or a uh, heterosexual couple, for sure, that um, attraction and sexuality really is, is a combination of both the physical as well as the, uh, you know, almost spiritual realms, this idea of sensuality that draws someone to another person. Breast cancer can change so much and every aspect of sexuality, you know, at its most rudimentary part because breast cancer changes the way someone appears outwardly, but also how someone feels about themselves internally. So that's the whole concept of say body image, you know, um, at its most extreme, uh, one may 
undergo mastectomy and then choose not to undergo reconstruction, sort of go through something called the aesthetic flat closure. And while that person undergoing an aesthetic flat closure might feel that this was the right option for them, their partner may mourn who this person was when they met and as they knew each other, you know, because there is still this concept of what one was drawn to physically when they when um, couples meet and that is a challenge after a cancer diagnosis and certainly if you think of the aspects that change with say chemotherapy you know the common agents that we use to treat breast cancer can induce hair loss can induce neuropathy then all of a sudden there's a compounding of the impact of touch so you know um, erogenous zones may have switched or turned off and all of a sudden those aspects of touch which used to draw someone into a more um you know sexual um needing um frame of mind it's dampened and certainly even after chemotherapy some may even lose the ability to achieve orgasm the orgasm may be weaker than before, or it may be even more difficult to achieve any orgasm. And that kind of thing can be very frustrating, not only for the person undergoing it, but for the person supporting them, especially since, you know, breast cancer is a social disease and there are, there are two people in a relationship and those people are undergoing the diagnosis at the same time. And it can lead to so many barriers in terms of communication because we don't give people a manual on how to navigate sexuality and intimacy after a cancer diagnosis. And quite frankly, for a lot of people, the changes do not make any sense at all because we take someone who is sexually vir virile, if I can use that term, or sexually, someone who owned their sexuality before a cancer diagnosis. And much like a computer, you turn it on, it whizzes, something appears on screen, you get to work and you're done and it's fine. But after a cancer diagnosis, the computer might whiz a bit, but there's no picture on the screen or it may turn off and you're left wondering in the panic or even just, just confusion as to what exactly just happened. And this, the unfortunate thing is a lot of oncologists are still not at the point where this is a conversation that's easily had. So people are left alone or trying to navigate it for themselves. And then there's also another person who's an intimate partner, who doesn't even know what questions to ask and doesn't really know how to navigate that with that person. Well, and you touched on internal feelings. So how can sex be emotionally different after a breast cancer diagnosis? I think, you know, what I've seen in the context of a sexual health clinic is that when, um, people say reach the end of our, the acute phase of cancer therapy, whether that be the, the surgery and the radiation, surgery, radiation and chemotherapy, there is a divergence of expectations. And there's um, this issue where people feel like um, when you're done with the chemotherapy, you're ready to go you're ready to move forward and you're ready to just, you know, make the most of your life, you know, leave cancer behind, let's go hand in hand and we're gonna walk into our future and everything's gonna be fine. That's a disconnect because a person who just underwent that experience is not the same person. And we talk about something called the new normal. We talk about what someone has to adjust towards life after cancer. And that's a process. And I tell people it might even take a year before that happens. Yeah. But if you have a hormone positive breast cancer, if you have a BRCA mutation, if you had HER2 positive disease and are you on some sort of a maintenance therapy, the journey doesn't end with that last dose of chemotherapy. There's follow-up, there's surveillance, there's the checks and there's the mammograms and you're never really done with the cancer experience. So that disconnect can be very difficult emotionally because how does one explain the lack of joy at the end of cancer? You know, you know, people wanna ring a cowbell, throw a party. And oftentimes, and I tell 
people at that point, it's okay if you don't feel like celebrating because there's fear of occurrence, there's fear of progression. There's also a lot of anxiety about having these tools we gave you to, to address cancer. We kind of take them away. We also take away the support. And so there's this isolation that also all of a sudden engulfs someone. And again, without the proper tools to communicate that, so many people are left trying to navigate it on their own. And I think that's something that webinars like this can address for them. Most definitely. I think we find ourselves just struggling through it. I def everything you said definitely resonates for me. Tell me about that. Been what down do that mean? road. <laughs> yeah. Well, just just in both the feelings of being set free and now what? Okay, my oncologist says we're done. Treatment's been successful, or we're moving on to the next phase, and then you're sort of let go, and you don't know what to do, yeah. where to put all of that energy that you've been putting into getting yourself to this point. And then you're surprised that, okay, now I've come to the end, but it doesn't feel the way that I expected. I may not feel that joy and exuberance and wanting to celebrate, ring the bell, what have you. Yeah, you know, what's and so then, interesting about that, Renice, is that, um, uh, we know that if you just take something like fear of cancer occurrence, for example, you know, mm -hmm. younger people experience that into a larger degree than older people with cancer. But we also know that, you know, uh, um, emotional partners experience that to a larger degree as well. So mm -hmm. oftentimes I think the experience of the partner that feeling of that they need to flee from the cancer experience is in and of itself a response to the fear of occurrence that right. if the whole thing might have been so terrifying that their reaction is to leave that experience behind them as soon as possible and again it's one of those conversations that can lead to an emotional gulf Yes, there are so many people who have had difficulties in their relationships in that way. And then, of, of course, some have come to an end. There's been a divorce. There's been some cheating or what have you. Yeah, you know, and I think what's, what's um, even more um, concerning, I think, is when you Look at the experiences of um, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, um, which I'll probably from this point forward just say the sexual and gender minoritized communities. There's very little work that's been done with that group and their experiences with cancer and their experience with their partners. Um, <clears throat> I think the challenges are similar, but in so many ways they're inherently different. Um, for example, I um, saw uh, um, a woman treated for breast cancer in consultation. And most of the times they'll either call my office or they'll go ahead and bring their partner with them. Sometimes I'll ask for my permission if their partner can come. It's kind of a rare thing um, for people to come by themselves. But this woman came by herself. And it really was this... Uh, feeling that she didn't know where to turn because her partner had stopped interacting with her um, and refused to touch her chest, um, you know, and trying to navigate that, you know, when she was the one that was shouldering almost all of this blame. Yeah. You know, um, it was a very, very complicated issue uh, to see that sexually the relationship had changed, but emotionally these walls were going up and this woman tried, was trying desperately to break them down, but she was coming by herself to do that. Yeah, it's 
it's definitely too hard to do by yourself when you're not the only person in the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I always wonder, and and we do see this, uh, I, I personally see this sometimes that there's so much guilt that people have about having undergone breast cancer. You know, there's this, you're right. It's a sort of sense. I was a burden to you. You know, I put you through so much, you know, I don't want to shoulder this. I will change for you because you were there for me. Um, but if you don't know what to change, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. hard to address it. And so as much as possible, if you are um, a member of the SGM community and you were treated for cancer, you know, breast cancer or something else, and your, your intimacy has suffered, you know, come with your partner. I think it's so important to do that because, you know, it's kind of like we say, it's like, you know, this is kind of like a dance and both yeah. of you need to relearn the steps, but you can learn them again. What I really love about that is having that encouragement that you can learn them again and move through to recapture. Yeah, for sure. Well, there's so many people, right, Renee, who kind of say, um, you know, I, you know, I guess I gave that up for cancer as well, or mm-hmm. you know, I lost it. Yet another I had someone, thing that cancer took from me. Yeah, someone even told me it's like I'm just damaged. I'm damaged. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's this, you know it's a sense of loss um, Mm -hmm. that I try to fight against because I think if you're one who wants sexuality in her life, who wants intimacy, who wants to experience sensuality again, you should be able to do that. Cancer does not need to take that away from you. Most definitely. Why might desire or libido be low? And is there anything that one can do to increase it? Yeah, that's an interesting question because really people who come to see me often say that they lack desire. It's the one thing. And I think for women, it's the easiest way to express um, that something something is wrong with their sexuality. By, by framing it in terms of desire. But when you peel that back, there are multiple reasons why desire is negatively impacted. And it's a rare thing in my experience where women treated for cancer will have a primary desire disorder or you know primary issues regarding desire, meaning all the other aspects of sexuality work well, you know, sensuality, touch, you know, sexual attraction, sexual um, performance, orgasm, it all works, but at the end, they don't want it again. That's a primary desire issue. Most of the time it's secondary because of pain um, with penetrative activities, because because of um, uh, sensations when touched, which is interesting, you know, there's this, concept my friend Jennifer Goss proposed of breast specific sensuality, which is, you know, over 80, almost 90% of women walking through a breast health center will tell you their breasts were an erogenous zone. Touching their breasts, touching their nipple was one of the things that was erotic that actually helped them get, become aroused, you know, which heightened desire, which led to, you know, sexual activities, the loss of the breast or anesthesia or lack of sensation at the chest wall or hyperesthesia, which, you know, you touching it elicits a painful or a bizarre sensation um, are some of the things that prevent that feedback loop where why would you want something again if it hurt, if it was uncomfortable, if you weren't getting aroused, you know? So there are these issues and, you know, Crystal had mentioned here about, you know, touch being so important and that is absolutely true. You know, there is an exercise that I will suggest to people called Sensate Focus. 
And it's really, it's an intimacy exercise. But what that does is it separates intimacy from sexual activity, intimacy divorced from intercourse. And it's really relearning how to interact non-verbally through touch and to help someone rediscover the areas of their body, which can heighten pleasure because it might be very different from what they you were relying on before they had cancer. I, well, I was definitely very fortunate in having Chris to be my partner and <laughs> to do those things um, for me. So I, I feel uh, that I was very fortunate. <laughs> it's nice to regard. hear that. <laughs> yeah, it definitely helped. So how can I talk to my doctor about my pain, discomfort, or other concerns? Yeah, you know, in an ideal world, a couple of things would happen. Um, one is you would, be know, you would be made aware of the potential changes. You know, there's this big drive in oncology to um, educate people before they're treated about issues that might impact them later on. Fertility being one of the bigger examples, we wanna make sure women of reproductive age or understand the impact of treatments on fertility and then access supportive services that can address those issues, right? Sexuality should be around that same time. You know, if, if, you, if radiation is gonna impact breast sensitivity, if chemotherapy is gonna impact sensitivity, and may actually worsen menopausal symptoms. It's really important that we tell that to people. If you're going to take an aromatase inhibitor or undergo ovarian function suppression, we need to make sure people are told about what that lack of estrogen will do to their bodies, including to the vaginal bulb and the vulva and how that can make sexual activities more difficult, um, you know, and I think we can do so much with the knowledge, you know, if I'm, if I, if you're aware of what could happen, then the next step is to say, well, that's not important to me, or it's going to be, if this happens, where do I go? What do I do? Right. Because I think that's a really important thing. What's happening now, I think for most people is that they're given a side effect profile, but it's very peripherally touching on sensuality and sexuality. So what ultimately ends up happening is these, these experiences occur and um, people are left wondering why and they're tr they try to navigate it for themselves. If you're in that situation, when you get the question from your doctor, which I hope everyone gets is, do you have any questions? <laughs> this is when I think you should bring it up. You know, just say, you know, even if you preface it, I know this might not make you comfortable, or I know this is not your area of expertise, but I need to tell you that I'm mm -hmm. having issues with sexuality. Where can I go for assistance? That would be really helpful. What I'm telling my colleagues is that it's important that they open the door to those conversations when, it ha when it's important to the person you're treating. And the way that I think my colleagues should do it is to incorporate a sexual history as part of the social history at some point when you're getting to know somebody, you know? So, you know, the way I, I try to do it is, you know, when during around the first few visits, if someone is coming alone, you know, I preface it by saying, you know, I'm going to ask you some things about your social life, because I just want to make sure I understand more about your supports. Who lives at home with you? Do you have an intimate partner? You know, and, and, and we try to get to things that way. And then I say, you know, sometimes these treatments may impact your ability to be sexual and your status, your satisfaction if that's something that ever happens, you know, let me know. It's important to know that when that door is open, people remember that and are more willing to walk through the door when it's relevant. But if you've never opened the door to put an onus on someone treated for cancer to bust that door down, <laughs> it's a very difficult yeah. thing. And it's not fair to ask patients to do that. And we know 
This is not something that patients will voluntarily discuss if they're concerned their doctor will be uncomfortable. And uh, along that line, what if your doctors don't understand your sexual concerns as mm -hmm. someone with a same sex partner, mm -hmm. for example? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I'd like to believe that um, people in the SGM community are, are, are open with their providers, but what we know uh, around the issues of medical care in the SGM community is that it's paved in a very difficult and tortured process where, you know, um, people have experienced hostility, people have experienced, uh, you know, not very welcoming, um, reception either by the front desk staff, the nurses, chemo infusion staff, or even their physician. And most of us, when we are patients, we want to be liked. And that might actually prevent a lot of us from coming out. So what do we do? We introduce our partner as a friend or my best friend. <coughs> and some, quite frankly, just don't want to be labeled, you know? I have a, I, I, I used to care for a woman who used to come with the same person all the time. And I, you know, this was early on in my career and I didn't ask who this person was until much later. And then I said, you know what? I am so sorry. I never asked before, but can I, can you just clarify for me what, who you are to each other? And they said, oh, this is my lover. I was like, oh, I'm glad to know that. And I was like, so you're, how do you classify yourself? <clears throat> Gay, lesbian, bisexual? And she said, why does that matter? And she was quite adamant. She didn't know and didn't want a label. But in my world, labels are how we track outcomes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, so, <laughs> but, you know, there are people who like, don't fit into neat categories, but that also makes it challenging to your question, but what do you do and how do you approach things if you are in a same-sex relationship? And I think it's the same, I would hope it's in the same way and that your doctor would be as sensitive um, as it would if you were a heterosexual couple which is, you know, the, there are issues in my relationship that I would like to address. And is there someone I can talk to? If that physician or nurse wants to pursue it with you, that's one thing, but you've given them the opportunity to refer you to someone who can help you, right? And I think that's really important that you not put your doctor as a, the person who will be your sex therapist or <laughs> who will be talking to you about, you know, to provide that sexual counseling. Because quite frankly, what scares a lot of oncologists is that they're going to walk into something that they have no idea how to navigate. And the last thing we want to do, you know, as people undergoing treatment for whatever is to get bad advice. Yeah. Right. Or to be blown off. It's like, well, you know what? It's okay because you know you're alive. Think of how beautiful it is to be alive. Right. <laughs> like, can yeah. we not minimize this experience? Yeah. Can we not turn this into a toxically positive moment? <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh <laughs> right. My gosh. So you know, and, and what I would say for clinicians who are treating same-sex partners is that we cannot assume sexual behaviors. Don't assume, you know, that, oh, this is, uh, they are lesbians, so they don't have penetrative intercourse or they don't have this and it's clearly, they don't do any of that. That's how we get people not screened for HPV mm -hmm. because we make assumptions and the assumptions are what's gonna get us, you know, it's gonna prevent us from helping people. So again, whoever is the go-to, you wanna know, have you worked a lot with same-sex partners? You know, and if they haven't, are you open? Are they, are they receiving what you're saying in an open way? Because if you get a sense that this is not comfortable, I think we in our community 
we need to listen to that. You know, and then we need to find somebody who can communicate in a way that's open. You know, I think that's really important. Yeah, and to not feel like you are the expert for everything. So you become that single source of, of information. Correct, correct, absolutely. So what are the best lubricants for different types of penetration and mm -hmm. stimulation? You know, what's interesting about that question, there was a, so there was a study that looked at water-based. <laughs> well, it was looking at water-based versus um, silicone-based uh, lubricants. And there was actually no preference um, on the type of lubricant except for um, penile anal intercourse, in which case um, water-based lubricants were preferred. Now, this was a study that was probably about 20 years older and so much has changed since then. There are different formulations out there. But what I would say is that for people treated for cancer, when it comes to lubricants, we wanna stay away from anything that's flavored, that plays with temperature, because oftentimes the vaginal vault is either thinned or, um, uh, or dried. And I think, you know, those um, additional compounds may not help you recover. But water-based or silicone-based lubricants are both fine. Um, uh, what I would also say, because I've had to say it, um, explicitly is that saliva is not a lubricant. It was never meant to be a lubricant and should not be treated as a lubricant. And on that, in that vein, what are your thoughts on coconut oil as a mm -hmm. lubricant or moisturizer? Well, so I think any kind of um, natural oil is fine to use externally. There's actually a theoretical reason where, why sexual health experts don't suggest you use it internally. And it really has, has to do with uh, bacterial con contamination and overgrowth within the vaginal wall, which might lead to urinary tract infections. I've never seen a case of that. There is a very small study that looked at olive oil for vaginal penetrative intercourse. And, you know, I think almost 80% of participants who use olive oil really appreciate it and liked it. I have call, um, I have um, uh, people I see who swear by coconut oil. But again, I think it's mostly about this theoretical concern that it might, might, um, might not be a good thing to use internally. But for external use, it's what I suggest and recommend as well. It's like, you know, plant-based or natural oils, I think are fine to use externally. Are there some other tips or sex products that you would recommend to try? Well, so what I would say is that it depends on the goals of what, what you're trying to, um, uh, address or um, work on as a, as a couple, or even as a, as a person not in a relationship, but wants to be ready for that time when they re-enter the dating world, right? Um, it's important to get a pelvic examination if you're worried or experience vaginal pain with any kind of penetrative activity, because it matters where the pain is experienced. So if it's pain at the entry into the vagina or the vestibule, that is readily treated with a very dilute form of lidocaine. And that was proven in a randomized trial among breast cancer survivors that the application of lidocaine, again, very dilute onto the vestibule was very effective in curing dyspareunia or painful intercourse. Um, now, what's important about that is that the other type of pain that can occur is that the va vaginal muscles spasm. Okay, so that, that experience of spasm uh, is sometimes experienced as thrusting, pain with any kind of thrusting motion, and that will not be treated with, um, vista, uh, with um, you know, dilute forms of lidocaine. And what we can do for that is either pelvic floor physical therapy as well as dilators. 
So those are a couple of things. Um, you know, there's multiple things on the market to help with orgasm. What I often will tell women is to, we want to work on the things that build up to orgasm as well. So again, working on intimacy, you know, um, really trying to foster desire and then also self-stimulation are all really important activities when we're trying to address orgasm. Wonderful. So how can you include a sexual partner or potential partner mm -hmm. in addressing sex and intimacy concerns? I mean, Especially perhaps for those getting back into right. relationships. Right. Yeah. I think what's really important is to understand that the cancer experience, especially for couples, was, is, is, a, is a pretty difficult one. Um, that, you know, the experience is a different, but it's, it's a really a valid and, um, uh, and highly emotional experience that both people have gone through. Um, so one of the things I often will say is that, you know, have them participate actively in the counseling where you're learning about the changes that cancer did to one's sexuality. Um, you know, these visits for me take an hour, but I try to explain it to both people in the room so they understand how much cancer can impact the sexual experience and the sexual domains. Uh, beyond that, I think one of the things is to try to talk about the experience in ways that frame it as I experienced, you know? And so a lot of that is not to use language that could be construed as blame, you know? So saying, you know, you weren't there for me, you know, or you won't touch my chest wall, um, you know, after a mastectomy, turn that around from the experience you witnessed the experience you have, mm -hmm. which is, you know, when I undress, I'm very conscious of my chest. And, you know, I wish you could touch it. So I, I know it's, it's a part of my healing, you know, framing things in I as opposed to you, I think are really important in this because there's a sense of grace, almost in stating that, but also when you frame your experiences in your own words, no one can take that away from you. It is your experience. It is what I felt. It is what I am going through. But I think for people who cared for someone who underwent cancer, um, there can be a very difficult moment where they're trying to reconcile and almost recover from the experience of being a caregiver back to being an intimate partner. You know, I, I know for more extreme, quote, extreme illnesses, like acute leukemia, where you know, someone has gone through a transplant, for example, the partner is oftentimes a caregiver, you know, a nurse almost, trying to keep this person on schedule with their pills, taking their temperature at home, bringing them back to the emergency room or the outpatient visits with much frequency. To go from that experience in one's head of being a caregiver and then asking them, now I want to have sex, can be very difficult yeah. for the partner. So allowing that, you know, I, say, I would say, giving that room to breathe and, and freely express itself is so important for you both to sort of understand what that experience was like for both. Because I think with that, there is the opportunity to grow from this. For sure. Gosh, there's <laughs> just so much, so many layers <laughs> that, that are involved here. Yeah, you know, and I think people often say, it's like, well, I don't need to have my, I don't really need to talk about sexual health because I don't have penetrative sex. And it was like, so this whole notion that sexuality is reduced to penetration is a very Western notion, right? And sort of, this is what we're taught. It's like, oh, sexuality is intercourse. 
And that's really not it. So it's almost as if the opportunity to learn about how complicated sexuality is for women only comes to you because you experience this yourself. But it's a very complicated, multi-domain, you know, experience that occurred so naturally until you got cancer. Something that I, I noticed my wife put in the chat is that we have sexual grazing so that it's just sexual contact without the intent to achieve orgasm. Yeah. Just to be intimate in, yeah. in that way uh, to greatly help. Yeah. And I think that's a point in sensate focus as well. You know, I think for people in, you know, in um, heterosexual relationships where it's really much different because the way say men think about intimacy, it's very much tied to intercourse. And that's not how women think about that. So actually talking to them about taking a stepwise approach so that you can actually separate the experience of intimacy from intercourse is a really important thing, but there's power in touch. And I totally agree with your wife about that, that touch can bring not only back what sexuality was for you before cancer, but can help you define an entirely new way to be sexual. For sure, for sure. So very true. Are there any other resources available on sex after, can after cancer or anything specifically for those who identify as LGBTQ plus? So again, it's, it's, it's a quite an unfortunate thing that there's not a lot of sensuality and sexuality resources for in SGM community undergoing the cancer experience and, and um, uh, um, having issues with sexuality. In fact, there was just this recent study that looked at the questionnaires we ask uh, about sexual health so we can sort of quantify the degree of difficulty people might be having. And a study out of Sloan Kettering said it was very heavily weighted towards a heterosexual perspective. So we don't even have questionnaires that we can do for the SGM communities after cancer and sexuality. There's so much work that needs to happen. So I think what we wanna do is instead of, because we really don't have those specific um, um, guides for the LGBTQ community after cancer and their sexuality, what we can do is focus it on an issue-based way and say, if you're looking through the bibliography of, you know, Women Cancer Sex by Anne Katz, which is a great book. If you find the symptom you want to look at, maybe it's desire, maybe it's pain, looking through the table of contents for that specific area and not necessarily focusing or being having your eyes sort of drawn away from a book because it's it's written really with a heteronormative perspective. I think that's one of the ways we can do it. It's a sort of a, a symptom specific way to look for guidance uh, until until we get those books for our own community. Wonderful. So let's take some questions that have been posed in the Q&A box. And folks, if you still have questions that you would like to ask, please do put them in the Q&A box and we can get those answered for you. The first is, can you say more about the impact of aromatase inhibitors and ovarian suppression? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So um, both of those, um, treatments are highly effective, especially for high-risk cancers. And for um, simplicity, high-risk breast cancers are those that require chemotherapy. So for younger and, women, go ahead. So sorry. Oh, <laughs> no, so. Just, I was going to ask about the impact of those things in um, the effect that they may have on our sexual function. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
you know, for women who have to take these medications who are being recommended to, unfortunately, ovarian function suppression and the occurrence of, an, of, of a much earlier menopause, as well as the combination of that, say, with aromatase inhibitors, because you can't use an aromatase inhibitor in younger women if their ovaries are working. So we need to suppress the ovaries to give them an, an aromatase inhibitor, right? The combination of them both can be very, very difficult. So it can cause uh, the genital urinary symptoms of menopause, so vaginal dryness, vaginal atrophy, changes in um, orgasmic thresholds, can cause pain with penetrative activities. It can actually dampen desire as a primary side effect. In fact, there was a really nice study in the journal Menopause about the effect of just the aromatase inhibitors and across all sexual related activities, there was a dampening from the aromatase inhibitors. But beyond that, ovarian function suppression can, in younger women, it's been my experience especially, it can cause some psycho-emotional distress um, that um, can make it very difficult to even devote time or energy into a sexual relationship. So, I mean, and for, you know, unfortunately, I think they're very powerful drugs in our, in our treatment armamentarium but the cost can be very significant. Yeah. So along that line, how can I accept my body after all the changes? So two things about that, which I think is a really important question. Number one is that I think time, it will be your friend in terms of um, gaining an acceptance of who you are after cancer. It's not an instantaneous process and the sort of quest for your normalcy can take time. So I think part of it is allowing yourself that time to quote heal. The second is that, you know, there was actually a very nice study um, about the power of group therapy in people who have issues with their body image. And I think surrounding yourselves with um, people in your breast cancer community who are having issues in adjusting to life after breast cancer, whether that be a virtual support group with YSC um, has, or even a virtual support group in your own community, there is very nice data that, you know, apart from just, you know, psychotherapy, that the community can heal each other. I think it's a really powerful thing. Definitely. I have to say that that has been my experience throughout. Yeah. It's crucial. And there's data. So you're. <laughs> <laughs> what are some other practical ways to help my partner, co survivor, see me as more than just my diagnosis yeah. or a cancer patient? So I think part of it really is allowing them the space to express themselves. Because again, I think for, for, peop, for partners who watched, you have to understand how helpless that situation is, that they can't give you your hair back and they can't stop the nausea. They can't stop this cancer and they can't stop what you're going through. There's very few ways, uh, very few times in one's life as a couple where you're gonna feel that powerless except in the medical setting where you can't do anything to help someone go through the experience they're going through. So there's that experience, but then there's also the fear that goes into so just after that diagnosis of cancer, the fear of loss, the fear of death, you know, the fear of, of having to separate them. So the trauma that someone's partner went through is also very important to acknowledge and give breath to. So oftentimes as people are having a, a difficult time sort of navigating, it's where I think I can be helpful in that sexual body health clinic because I can give them the permission to sort of talk about the experience from their viewpoint. And then it's a time where I can also, you know, sort of gently, you know, um, urge them to phrase things in a way that expresses what they went through rather than what you put me through, you know, because even if it's not 
met that way. This is a place where you're walking on eggshells, the both of you. You're walking on because you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. You really want to move forward. And you really want to do it together. So you need that safe space to sort of express it. But then the other thing is, you know, I like to sort of like to um, have couples express to each other their wishes and their desires. It's sort of, I wish, I want, you know, just this kind of language. Um, uh, I think it's really important. So what do you want right now in terms of your relationship? Where do you want to go to? And what do you, what do you fantasize about? Sort of what do you wish for? You know, and then oftentimes it's eye-opening for the couple to hear from each other about what they want because it's never anything, you know, out of reach. You know, it's like, I, I, I want to see you smile. You know, I wish, you know, we, I wish I could sleep through the night without worrying about you. You know, it's, it's really, you know, I think for most couples, you know, there's just so much fear at the end of treatment that I don't think many people know what to do with it. That is so true. There's, in addition to, I wish, I want, uh, as I was taking notes, yeah. I also wrote down, I need. Yes, that's the one that I forgot. About. <laughs> I wish I want, I need. That's correct. <laughs> And then I see in the chat that my wife said, telling your partner how they can touch you is hugely helpful. Right. Because and, you know, there's the fear of causing harm mm-hmm. inadvertently during and after healing. Right. But then, and you know, there's also this, it's interesting that women adopt um, behaviors that they're comfortable with without even knowing it. You know, I once, um, you know, was counseling a woman who until she said it was not aware it was happening but she would never have sex without a shirt on post mastectomy um even if her husband asked us here why she would never take that trip but she didn't really realize that until she said it you know and you know, we explore that a little bit. And it's the point of what I do is not to say you need to get to a point where you can take your shirt off in front of your husband. That's not my job. My job is to say, where do you want to go with this? And if she said, you know, I just feel more comfortable with my shirt on. You know, those are really important words to just say out loud because her husband was under the impression that she was ashamed of her body. And maybe there was a component of that, but in their intimate relationship, that's where her comfort was. That's where it, that's where it lay. And he was just overthinking that experience. And she was, didn't really know how else to say what she wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah, oh, it's so hard. Yeah, it is. <laughs> So that's it for questions. Thank you for an engaging discussion and everyone sharing their experiences. We look forward to you joining us for the second part of this series on August 17th. Again, you will receive a reminder via the email address that you provided to register for that session as well. If you have not registered for that session, please do so so you can receive the Zoom login information for that. You will see a evaluation pop up when the session closes. Please use it to share your experience and let us know what you look forward to hearing about next time. Thank you to Dr. Dizon and to all the rest of you who have joined us. We greatly appreciate it and hope that you have a wonderful evening. Oh, it was a pleasure spending some time with you. Thank you so much. Wonderful with you as well. (laughs) Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.